Four Americans were involved in a kidnapping that turned deadly during a cartel shootout. McGee, Woodard, and two close friends drove to Matamoros from South Carolina last week when they were attacked and kidnapped by Gulf Cartel gunmen. But they apparently got caught up in a shootout between rival drug gangs. Driven around for days, they ended up here. ABC News obtaining this video of the crime scene where the Americans were eventually found. They were found in a stash house outside the city of Matamoros, Mexico. Bloodstains still on the floor. Shaid Woodard and Zindel Brown were killed. On Friday, March 3, 2023, Latavia, Shaid, Eric, and Zindel began the grueling drive from South Carolina to Mexico for a cosmetic procedure for one of the travelers. Shortly after crossing the Mexican border city of Matamoros, Mexico, the four U.S. citizens were kidnapped in a brazen attack carried out by cartel gunmen. U.S. officials confirmed two of the four friends were found dead. The other two were alive but injured. The surviving Americans were identified as Latavia McGee and Eric Williams. The two Americans killed were later revealed to be Zendel Brown and Shaid Woodard. Mexican federal and state officials escorted the two surviving Americans to an international bridge at the U.S.-Mexico border. The four Americans traveled to Matamoros from Brownsville, Texas in a rented white minivan en route to a cosmetic surgeon's office. Their vehicle came under fire shortly after it crossed the U.S.-Mexican border, and a viral video posted to Twitter shows the exact moment of the kidnapping taking place. In the video, Latavia is forced by men into the bed of the white pickup truck. The men then proceed to forcibly drag two other people into the vehicle. Mexican authorities found the Americans in a wooden shack in a rural area east of Matamoros. The FBI confirmed that the friend group was fired upon by rival drug cartels in the middle of a shootout, and the white man the friend group was driving crashed as a result of the attack. This is an all-too-common occurrence when it comes to traveling to rural Mexican cities or dangerous border towns. For decades, a night out in Matamoros was part of the two-nation vacation for spring breakers flocking to Texas's South Padre Island, but increased cartel activity over the past 10 to 15 years has frightened away much of that business. The case previously covered on this channel of Mark Kilroy is a perfect example of the devastating effects of these cartel attacks on tourism and traveling safety. That hasn't prevented tourists from flocking to these dangerous regions, nor has it stopped the rampant number of kidnappings of Mexican citizens among smaller cartels in order to receive payments for their much-needed arsenals. One of the less highlighted cases of these kidnappings comes from Mexico City in the year of 2012. It involves two friends in their late teens named David and Miguel. On January 5, 2012, David Ramirez and Miguel Rivera began a road trip to celebrate Miguel's birthday. David was a 19-year-old college student from Mexico City when him and his best friend Miguel were on their way to a coastal village close to Guerrero, Mexico. Before making it to the location, they were kidnapped en route by armed gunmen. David was taken first, according to a text message that his friend Miguel frantically sent, pleading to call David's mom and that they are putting him in a vehicle. A few hours later, David managed to contact his sister Deborah. He was crying and begging over the phone that he needed help. Then suddenly the call dropped, and when Deborah called back, she received no response. The two young men haven't been heard from since. When someone finally picked up the call, it wasn't the familiar voice of her brother. The voice demanded to get David's father on the line, and Deborah asked if it was the police on the phone. They responded with a brief and cold no, and said her brother was involved in a kidnapping. Desperate to get their sons back, David and Miguel's family made a payment to the kidnappers. David's family decorated their house with balloons and signs that read, Welcome back, David and Miguel, but neither of the two young men ever made it back home. In a cruel and often utilized tactic, the kidnappers cut off all contact after getting their first ransom payment from the families. Five years after the disappearance of David and Miguel, the investigation into their kidnapping has gone nowhere. But Deborah believes the reason for this is obvious and troubling. She believes the authorities are working with the kidnappers. Deborah is convinced that the police are being paid by the cartel to look the other way. Regardless, she hangs on to the hope that her brother and his friend will one day come home. The harsh reality is that after the first ransom payment is received, these individuals are disposable to the cartel, and they want to get rid of their victims as quickly as possible. By going after less high-profile people, the cartel can collect more ransom payments without garnering too much unwanted attention. In the 1990s, most kidnapping gangs were made up of police officers, both active and retired, who targeted the affluent citizens of Mexico's business and political elite. The high-profile kidnapping in the 1994 case of Alfredo Harp Elu, a Mexican entrepreneur whose family paid $30 million for his release, perpetuated this trend. But for many criminal groups, the risks inherent in these kidnappings, such as the publicity and police attention they garner, aren't enough to justify the risk-to-reward ratio. As a result, beginning in the early 2000s, criminal groups shifted their efforts towards middle- and lower-class individuals. Criminal groups earn less per victim, but could carry out more kidnappings without attracting the unwanted attention of local authorities. 
Not only were the rich and famous vulnerable, but now the rest of the population was too. And the drug cartel democratized kidnapping from something that only happens to the rich to something that could happen to anyone. Now to me personally, the worst type of situation to find yourself in against the cartel is if you are caught smuggling drugs into their territories. What happens during the next few days of your life are filled with anxiety inducing dread as you wait for the inevitable. And rather than giving you a swift execution, the cartel makes a spectacle and cautionary warning of your death. And to achieve this, they often take you out into a field where you are disrobed and exhausted from the previous day's starvation and torture. Now, the torture can be done for a variety of reasons, such as extracting information, passing the time, or wanting to sexually assault their victims prior to their death. If their intention is to make a spectacle of their victim, the cartel then stand in a crowd around the smuggler while one of the members records a message for the victim's family. The cartel includes some sort of threatening warning to any future smugglers looking to infiltrate their sales region before murdering their subjects on camera. Now, the most popular method is to sever the victim's neck with a machete. It's a barbaric and intimate process where the cartel members are purposely trying to inflict as much pain as possible. When looking up testimonials from cartel guards, I came across an interview describing the process leading up to the victim's death. Now, each kidnapping obviously starts with locating the target. The best place is at the victim's home early in the morning when everyone is asleep. But sometimes the victims are kidnapped from public spaces, and if the target is unarmed, two men are enough to carry out the kidnapping. If the target is armed, it requires more manpower and vigilance to carry out the act. After being captured, the victim is taken to a safe house or far enough out into the woods that no one will hear them scream for help during the next step, which is usually interrogation and torture. The guard then describes the most utilized methods during these practices, which involve beating and tasing the victims while their faces are covered in a wet cloth. The guard being interviewed confirms everything is learned on the fly and there's no formal training leading up to the interrogation. They confirm it usually takes just one night to get the information they are seeking, and when submitting to the crime, their victims are abruptly killed and are never heard from again. The dead are buried in grave sites, dumped into oceans, or burned out in fields. And if the organization wants to send a message to another cartel, a victim's tortured body is typically dumped in a public area or recorded and posted to the internet. The kidnapping surge in Mexico is fueled in large part by the insatiable U.S. demand for drugs. To fulfill the demand of the U.S. supply, the Mexican criminal organizations require extensive personal and vast reserves of assault rifles and other weapons. Beginning around 2006, criminal groups began to use the ransom money from these low-profile kidnappings to help fund these various necessities. One of the most prominent stories to come out of these kidnappings is a tale of a mother named Miriam Rodriguez attempting to save her kidnapped daughter from the drug cartel. Miriam, who lived in San Fernando, Tamaulipas, became an activist and vigilante after her 20-year-old daughter Karen was abducted on January 23, 2014 by the Zetas cartel. Karen was in her pickup truck when our men forced their way into her vehicle and abducted her. Her family followed the kidnapper's demands and took out a loan to pay the ransom, and Miriam even met with a cartel member who offered to help find Karen for $2,000, but the family later found out that they were deceived and Karen's remains were found at an abandoned ranch almost a year later. Miriam Rodriguez dedicated the rest of her life to achieving justice for her daughter. The information she gave police ensured that the criminals responsible for her daughter's killing were jailed, and to track down the killers, she changed her hair and appearance, used a fake ID, and adopted many different disguises. In one instance, she pretended to be a pollster to collect names and addresses. In another, she pretended to be a healthcare worker. And Miriam also impressively captured a cartel member while he was selling roses on the street. The street vendor recognized her and began to run away, but Miriam managed to catch up to him and tackled him to the ground. She held a gun to his throat and threatened to kill him if he moved. Her efforts were often applauded by members in her community, but placed an incredible target on the scorned mother's back. And unfortunately, her vigilante efforts were brutally cut short on Mother's Day 2017 when a gunman killed her outside her home just weeks after she chased down her last target. Her husband found her body lying face down on the street, her hand in her purse next to her pistol. The Mexican government has been largely unsuccessful in their efforts to reduce these kidnappings and killings. A large part of this failure can be attributed to the high levels of internal corruption. And many kidnappers feel that the odds of the Mexican police having the skills or inclination to come after them are very low. It doesn't help that statistically only 1% of all kidnappers are captured and carried to justice. As these abductions continue to increase, more and more families will experience the pain of seeing loved ones disappear, and many of them must face the grim reality that they may never see them again.